composers of the uh, 17th century, um, but was forgotten for many years um, until Juana Landowska and Vladimir Horowitz started to record his sonatas, and that started a rebirth. But in fact, although he was a great virtuoso during his life, probably never played in public, he played at the, the court and where he was employed, um, and he was a very self-effacing, modest personality, which also kept him from being in the limelight, which is what he preferred. His music uh, is mainly, what we know him for are these 550 plus uh, sonatas, which are not sonatas like classical sonatas. They're not, they don't have a, an exposition and a development and a recapitulation like that comes later with Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven. Um, his sonatas are very short. The longest is about seven minutes. Um, and they're all, they're brilliant and they range from very sort of saccharine almost to very savage. And there's a sort of, Historians love to divide composers into early, middle, and late periods, which he sort of d does have. Um, he gets more and more complicated and interesting as he gets older. His early life was in Naples. He was born in Naples. He was the sixth child of 10 children of Alessandro Scarlatti, who was a very, very famous theater and opera composer in Italy. And his father, through his whole life, dearly wanted this prodigy son of his, who was obviously extremely gifted, to follow in his footsteps and be a, an opera and theater composer. He himself wrote over 100, I think 114 theater pieces in his life, the father. And Domenico obviously just wanted to be a keyboard player and loved to play the harpsichord. And um, he, there was obviously this tension right from the beginning, and you feel it all the way through their lives together. Um, the harpsichord at that time was sort of considered an instrument for dilettantes and a, an accompanying instrument. It was sort of um, you know, far back in the orchestra. It didn't get any respect, so his father really tried to steer him away. Um, when he was about, he didn't have uh, real music lessons. He probably just sort of picked it up from his father and the many musicians in the family and the opera singers and the swarming musicians who were in the house all the time. Um, but he started working as a musician very early. He got his first professional job at the age of 15. I'm going to play you uh, another sort of typical, one of the simpler ones, but it gives you an idea of the sort of dance rhythms that he used, the sort of syncopations. There's also often a kind of sound like hunting horns or the bugles that you would hear in those days. Um, so this is another sonata in C major, K159. So his 
first professional work was at, eight, at 15, at the age of 15, he was hired by the Neapolitan court as the court organist and composer, which is quite a, an amazing job for a 15 year old, but it wasn't what his father wanted him to do. So his father immediately took him away from Naples and had him apply for a job um, with the Frederick de' Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Um, he was not hired by the Grand Duke, so his father sent him back to, Tus to uh, Naples to take over the opera season for the, for the year in Naples. Um, and Domenico dutifully went back to Naples, uh, wrote two operas himself that year, and directed the opera season, which was not a success. So um, his father again tried to get him a job with uh, Frederick de' Medici a couple of years later. Again, it didn't work. But to apply for the job, he had to go to Venice. And he loved Venice. And he decided that he wasn't going to go back to Naples and he would stay in Venice. Venice at that time was a center of musicians. Any traveling European musician would come through Venice on their way to wherever uh, Rome and uh, point south. And, and Vivaldi was in Venice. And there was so much going on, he decided to stay. And there are some great stories from his five or six years that he spent in Venice. Um, uh, there was uh, an Irish keyboard virtuoso who was traveling through and was in Venice at the time named Thomas Rosengrave, and he wrote this. Um, he saw a grave young man dressed in black and in a black wig who had stood in one corner of the room very quiet and attentive, who was asked to sit down to the harpsichord. When he began to play, I thought that 10 hundred devils had been at the instrument. I never had heard such passages of execution and effect before. The performance so far surpassed my own in every degree of perfection to which I thought it possible I should ever arrive, that if I had been in sight of any instrument with which to have done the deed, I should have cut off my own fingers. <laughs> Upon inquiring the name of this extraordinary performer, I was told it was Domenico Scarlatti, son of the celebrated Alessandro Scarlatti. And Rosengrave said he didn't touch an instrument himself for a month after hearing Scarlatti. <laughs> so he was really uh, an amazing virtuoso. And still a, only a, a kid in his late teens. Um, a couple of years later, when he was 21, he was a masquerade, one of the many masquerades in Venice. And uh, some guy sat down at the harpsichord with a mask on. So he see who it was and started to play and apparently Scarlatti decided it was either the devil or the famous handle um, behind the mask and it, of course turned out to be Handel. Um, Scarlatti was born in 1685, the same year as Handel and Bach. He never met Bach and Bach probably never heard any Scarlatti sonatas but he did meet Handel, this was their first meeting, both at 21 years old and uh, they were very, very uh, fond of each other. Um, at that particular masquerade when he discovered this was Handel, the host of the masquerade decided to set up a competition between the two of them. And apparently Handel won the organ competition, but the, the harpsichord competition was a tie. So, um, and Handel was considered the top virtuoso on keyboard in Europe at the time, so that put uh, Scarlatti right up there. Uh, one writer said, Handel often spoke of this person with great satisfaction, and indeed there was reason for it, for besides his great talents as an artist, he had the sweetest temper and the genteelest behavior. And a Spanish oboist of the time related that when Scarlatti mentioned Handel's name, he would cross himself as a token of veneration. So I'll play another, uh, this is again in binary, this one's in E major, a little bit later, uh, but it, it gives you some sort of instrumental color of violins playing and, and he, they were hearing Vivaldi and Corelli a lot, these great string uh, orchestras that were playing. So he was very interested in that kind of sound that he reproduced on the harpsichord. <laughs>
woodwinds at the beginning, so very orchestral color. Um, so he was 24 years old and got a job in, Ven in Rome. His father was already working there for a, ca a cardinal, a very famous cardinal named uh, Cardinal Otto Boni, uh, who was famous as a wild and crazy guy. Um, he was fabulously rich, uh, and he ran a crazy salon with uh, um, everything you can imagine that would be unchurchly. Uh, he supported his own orchestra, and he also had Corelli living in his palace. Um, and he also supported many artists and other musicians, writers, many mistresses. He, according to Kirkpatrick, who's Scarlatti's main biographer and um, editor, uh, this cardinal had 60 to 70 bastard children who he was also supporting. And uh, so his father was the maestro di cappella at this cardinal's salon and uh, court. And uh, the son, Domenico, our Scarlatti, got a job with one of the cardinal's best friends, who was the queen of Poland, Queen Casimiri, in Rome. And she also had a wild and crazy salon. He became, at this very young age, the only 24, uh, the maestro de cappella for Queen Casimiri. And he was required to uh, write a lot of chamber music and uh, theater music and opera and stuff for her. So still he was very much under the thumb of his father. He then, from there, got a job at the Vatican um, and as the uh, maestro de cappella in the, in the Vatican, one of the main chapels, and at St. Peter's. And he also, at the same time, was working freelance for the ambassador from Portugal, who had the most beautiful embassy in Rome, because Portugal had been looting all their colonies and was very, very rich at the time. <coughs> so um, he was doing very, very well. He stayed in Rome for 10 years, but still very, very much under the thumb of his father. And Kirkpatrick writes that the music that he wrote during his time, uh, although professional, was still boring and derivative, mostly. Um, but then, at the age of 34, he was hired by the royal family of Portugal. And he decided that this was the time to leave, and he went at the age of 34 <coughs> to be the head of, of uh, music at the royal court in Portugal. Uh, this was his real blossoming. He was finally geographically separated from his loving but overwhelming father. And um, he stayed in Portugal for 10 years. Not only was he directing uh, music there, and he arrived to great fanfare and uh, fireworks and many concerts and so on, he was also obliged, uh, to his great satisfaction, to be the music master for the royal family. And this included a little princess named Maria Barbara. His life ended up being entwined with Maria Barbara for the rest of his life. She was obviously a very brilliant little girl, she was an excellent harpsichordist, a, a composer. She spoke six languages and so on. And she was destined to become the Queen of Spain. So uh, I'll, write, uh, I'll, I'll play you just a couple of things from his time in Portugal. Um, I just found this little, uh, I will play you the whole thing, just a bit of the first part. But this was uh, also a very woodwindy, one of the slow pieces, one of the few slow pieces based um, the Kirkpatrick found later, it was based on a Portuguese folk song.
get at. This is one of the few pieces that's not in binary form, um, and it's not a fugue. Uh, Bach was busy in Germany developing a fugue form, but it's a kind of fugetting. You hear the same melody appearing first in the soprano and then later on in the other voices. <laughs>
upside down. He had dinner at 2 o'clock in the morning and breakfast at 5 and whatever. So the whole court had to follow this. Everyone was in despair and exhausted. And um, Maria Barbara and her husband, her new husband, really took solace in music. And so their part of the court was just nonstop music and a little hunting and fireworks on the side. So Scarlatti was extremely important in this scenario. Um, not too long after they arrived in Spain, Queen Isabel, in desperation, invited Farinelli, who was famous all over Europe as the greatest singer since Orpheus, to come and sing for her husband. And she hoped that maybe he would somehow bring him out of this big depression he was in. Uh, the king hadn't been out of bed for many, many months. He wouldn't get dressed, he wouldn't shave, he wouldn't allow his hair to be cut. So Queen Isabel had Farinelli stationed in a, an adjoining room, at, um, adjoining the king's bedroom, bedchamber, and Farinelli started to sing. And by the second song, the king had sat up in bed and demanded to, to be introduced to the singer. So Farinelli was brought into the king's bedroom, and the king said, ask anything you want, any wish that you have will be granted. And so Farinelli had been well coached by Queen Isabella and, she, and he said, oh, my dearest wish is that you rise from your bed and, and you know, allow yourself to be shaved and, and dressed and come as a preside at your council. And lo and behold, a miracle occurred. <laughs> and the king got up, got dressed and went and became a king again. So, so the queen was overjoyed and asked Farinelli if he would stay in Spain and at the court, and she offered him a, a ridiculous salary, and she said that she would build him the greatest opera house in Europe. So Farinelli said, okay. <laughs> so um, from then on, the two Italians, Farinelli and Scarlatti, were uh, running music at the Spanish court. And uh, Farinelli's opera house, in fact, was the greatest in Europe. It had the best singers, the greatest new mechanical scenery, and so on. And uh, he ran this thing very lavishly for many, many years. Um, the king sort of went up and down and became quite psychotic eventually. Um, but uh, so this was the atmosphere. And although this great opera house was right there, Scar Scarlatti had absolutely no connection with that part of the music of the court. So it really indicates how little he was interested in music, theater, and opera. Uh, around this time, he, uh, not long after he arrived at the Spanish court, he was given a knighthood by the Portuguese court. And this was in the Order of San Diego. It was, uh, he was granted special permission to wear clothes of velvet and silk in any color, rings, jewels, chain line, clothing of gold, inasmuch as the hat be of velvet. And this was the apogee of the family fortune, so now they were aristocracy. Uh, the same year, Scarlatti dedicated his first collection of harpsichord pieces that he actually wrote down to the King of Portugal. And um, after the usual sort of obsequious dedication, he wrote, Scarlatti wrote, Re Dear reader, whether you be dilettante or professor, in these compositions do not expect any profound learning, but rather an ingenious jesting with art, only obedience moved me to publish it. So he's very self-effacing and not your usual glory to God kind of dedication. Perhaps they will be agreeable to you. Show yourself more human than critical and thereby increase your own delight. And he ended up with Vivi Felice, a very unusual ending for a dedication, uh, meaning just live happily. So he, it was a very simple modern gesture and he, um, there was a feeling that uh, um, he was a man of the enlightenment a little bit more. When he arrived in Spain, the Inquisition was still going on. There was, of course, this great influence of the Moors and the Gypsies and Flamenco. Um, the plague was coming through all the time. It was an atmosphere of, of doom and fear and terror. And, and um, Kirkpatrick says it would be a sort of traditional conflict, Spanish conflict between um, pagan sensuality and fear of damnation. So, and, and he arrived in this and, and sort of just wrote beautiful, happy, happy music. So, uh, didn't seem to bother him a whole lot except that the, the sort of gypsy um, influence did come in and the instrumental instrument um, in Spain. Um, his 
wife, soon after he was knighted, died. She, was, she had given birth to six children. She was 27 years old. And um, her mother moved in to look after the kids and stayed for the rest of the life of his um, children and, and his new wife, who he married a year later, who, who also gave him another four children. The next period is his flamboyant period. This is uh, the name given by Kirkpatrick. And it's called the flamboyant period because it's really the most brilliant keyboard writing that he did. And one of the characteristic parts of this period is that he used a lot of hand crossing all the time. So if you're over there, you won't see it so much. Um, but by then, Maria Barbara, his student, was a really a very, very brilliant player, too. So he had to keep writing all this great music for her. So this is a sonata in A major from the flamboyant period. It has more hand crossings than anything else that he wrote. <laughs> more uh, contrapuntal. It's not uh, a fugue. It doesn't carry a voice through. They seem to sort of enter and disappear. Uh, but it's sort of more, much more in the style of Palestrina, Frescobaldi, who he loved. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, and now I'll, I'll play you one more. Uh, it, this is in C major, also from this middle period. And in this second part, he uses a little bit of a pattern like this. And it's kind of anticipating the Alberti bass, which is used in the um, classical period. Uh, sonatas that he had written. The late period, he 
wrote a lot more, there's a lot more sort of instrumental Spanish effects. And I'm going to play just a little, little bit of, um, this is one I found, I'll just play a little bit of the first part. You clearly hear sort of a wailing gypsy at one point, um, guitarist strumming and sort of swirling of scales going up and down and up and down. So that, you, know, you can imagine sort of a band in a village square or something like that. some bagpipes in the middle of this piece. And then uh, after he's played all these chord clusters, it almost sounds like he was just putting his elbow on the, on the keyboard. Then he trans, uh, then he, he goes into a very sort of saccharine little dance. And it's all, I feel like he's sitting there laughing at me when I play this. It's really a joke. <laughs> children were musicians, and they were not interested in keeping any of his stuff. So there's not one manuscript of Scarlatti's existing. 
they, what they did keep very, very carefully down to the present day are the documents relating to his knighthood. So <laughs> the family <laughs> can prove that it was aristocracy. Uh, they sold off, he, he left a huge estate with many coaches and um, paintings and furniture and so on. Everything was sold off through the generations. His, the line comes down from his eldest son, Fernando. So there are still Scarlattis in Spain descended from our Dominico Scarlatti. When Maria Barbara died not long after, she left these beautiful bound copies of the sonatas that he had done for her to Farinelli. And um, after her husband's death, a new king came and uh, Carlos III, who was Fernando's brother, he hated music, he hated musicians. He called Farinelli a capon fit only to eat <laughs> and uh, threw them all out. So Farinelli went back to Italy, he built himself a gorgeous house in Bologna, and his copies, these copies of the Scarlatti Sonatas from the Queen, ended up in a library in Venice. Thank goodness for us. <laughs> there was another copy, uh, not as complete, but ended up in a library in Parma, and otherwise there were just a few little copies of very early pieces left. So if we hadn't had that, that uh, set for Farinelli, these would all have been forgotten. Um, I, I, uh, then for 200 years they weren't played. Did I, I, did I tell you they were used as uh, studies, basically? And there was a quote from Proust where he wrote about the Scarlatti Sonatas, those confounded pieces which have so often kept you awake when they've been played over and over again by a merciless student on an adjacent floor. <laughs> so that's, that was the attitude to Scarlatti Sonata. Um, he once admitted that he had broken all the rules of composition, but he asked, do these deviations from the rules offend the ear? And on being answered in the negative, he said, well, there was scarcely any other rule to follow. <laughs> I'm going to end with uh, another one of the slower ones. This is quite a well-known one. Uh, to me, it sounds like um, a, a sort of a military parade. And um, he, you have to imagine that he lived all his life at the Spanish court, or mature life, watching parades and festivities and hearing bugles and hunting horns and so on. So all of that is I hear in this. It's sort of, you get a kind of a Doppler effect of this marching band coming from far and distant, getting closer and closer, and then in the end sort of fading off again into the distance. 